So we're going to be in chapter 23. If you want to turn to chapter 23 today. Last week we uh, had a great opportunity going through chapter 22, looking at this beautiful song that uh, David had written. And uh, we found a lot of interesting information within this particular psalm. Now, before we start, on a lighter note, okay, um, we know that we live in a time where there's a lot of confusion between men and women, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. Anyway, I found something really funny online, so I'm going to share it with you at the risk of getting stoned. Uh, I got I got this is, you're going to love this. So this is a lady at work. She says, my supervisor was really mad. He called me and he said, Luna, why haven't you been at work all week? And I said, I was there. You just couldn't see me. Couldn't see me? She said, no. I identify as invisible. So I am a transparent. My pronouns are who and where. That's the world we're living in today, right? I saw another one. The lady said, I am pudgy, but I identify as trans skinny. Trans. <laughs> So anyway, we, we can laugh at that. Uh, I think that was pretty, pretty telling. Yeah, we did. Mm-hmm. You know, we can go all kinds of places with that word now, can't we? Speaking of words, uh, chapter 23. <laughs> Try to get down to serious business now. Verse 1, these are the last words of David. All right, let me just say, they're really not the very last words of David. But these are pretty close to the last words of David. So anyway, uh, as we get closer and closer to end in this, this, uh, this book of Samuel here. Thus says David, the son of Jesse. Thus says the man raised upon high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, a morning without clouds like the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure. For this is all of my salvation and all my desire. Will he not make it increase? But the sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away, because they cannot be taken with hands. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the shaft of a spear. They shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. So, you know, a lot of times when a person approaches older age, I would say, uh, ripened, um, get kind of, you get kind of reflective of, of your life. You, we, we tend to look back at the summation of our existence, um, especially when we know that uh, maybe we're close to leaving this place, and uh, we tend to reflect on things. And that's what David is doing here. He's reflecting on the past. He's reflecting on his life. And he's being very, very honest in this um, 
reflection that he's having here as he remembers the ups and the downs, the victories and the failures that he had. And when he starts out, he starts this section right here, probably with the utmost humility. Because, you know, his dad really wasn't a famous man, wasn't a rich man. He had sheep and farmed, and he was just kind of like your regular old hard-working guy, raising a family. He came from very, very humble uh, beginnings. And that's how he starts this out. Speaking of himself as David, the son of Jesse. And it's a neat thing to, to look at this and to, to, to think about how well, David actually himself, he, even within his family, didn't really have any pull. He really didn't have any authority. He really didn't have um, any fame or recognition of somebody special in his family. As a matter of fact, they looked upon him as a, a ruddy, little, dirty little boy. And they would send him out to do a girl's job, watch the sheep. And what a humble beginning that is, right? Um, so what brings David, after all that we've read about him, after all these things that we've seen, I love this as he's looking back now, as he's reflecting on his life, the first thing out of his mouth is, I came from very, very humble beginnings. And then, thus says the man, raised upon high. It's important that we understand that as he goes on, he says, he was, the anoint, he was anointed by the God of Jacob, and he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. Just within a, one verse, we've gone from a shepherd boy to a man that's been lifted on high, anointed by the God of Jacob, and a sweet psalmist of Israel. Amazing to see. Now, now, you don't see anything in here where David's going, and through lots of hard work and dedication, I was raised up on high. I had talents that began to bloom, and people flocked to me, and I was just so wonderful, and I was raised nothing of that sort. Same thing in our lives tonight. Every one of us can say, you know, I had humble beginnings. When it came to my relationship with God, I had humble beginnings. I had to come to God with humility. You know that God rejects pride. You know that he doesn't listen to the prideful. And if he finds one that is prideful, then he has a miraculous way of chopping that down in a person's life. Through circumstances, always not necessarily terrible circumstances, because um, how is it that a person can come to the end of themselves without experiencing some sort of absolute self-destructive behavior patterns? Can he do that? Absolutely. People have come to the end of themselves not so much because they were druggies, or they were adulterers, or fornicators, or alcoholics, or thieves, or any of those things. Some, a lot of people, came to God after they realized, I was trying to be the guy on high. And I realized after all that work, and all that struggle, and all that commitment to trying to be somebody, when I got there, I began to realize that I'm really nobody. And it's lonely up here. And it's not a blessing to be the man at the top of the ladder, so to speak. So I think that people can experience in the midst of a, what we would look at and say they had a good life. They can have that good life, but they can still come to a place in their lives where they recognize the emptiness of things. Solomon's a great example of that. He talks about it. He talks about how everything is emptiness. 
Everything is vanity. Nothing is new. You can't accomplish something that hasn't already been accomplished. Think about it. And so if you're a man like Solomon, a person like Solomon, who really endeavored to experience everything he could about life, that's his conclusion. Everything is empty. As a matter of fact, he's so frustrated, Solomon says, you know, it really makes me angry that I have worked so hard to build such a kingdom, and I'm just going to leave it to a bunch of brats, and they're going to squander it when I'm gone. What's the use? What's the purpose? And how many times do we really see that happening in real life today, in the times that we live in today? So people can become humbled even when they're up here. A lot of people get humbled when they're way, way down here. Sometimes the guys that are way, way down here, that process of being humbled might have to happen over and over and over again before they finally realize, I'm trying to fill my life with something. I'm searching for something. And everything that I've sought out, everything that I have tried, has left me empty. It's left me wanting. It's water that doesn't satisfy my thirst. And I really need to know why I'm here and what life is really all about. Is there really a God? Do I have an a, a, a eternal purpose for being in existence? Or am I just kind of in and out? Here for a few years, born get old, die, and that's the end of it. Well, a lot of people believe that in their lives. They, they don't know about everlasting life. They don't know about eternity, or they don't believe in eternity. They think that when you die, that you cease to exist. And we know that that's not true. Every single human being has eternal existence. Did you know that? A lot of times we think, oh, well, if you're not born again, then you're not going to live forever. Oh, yeah, you are going to live forever. Question is, what's your address going to be? Right? 666? You know? Yeah, and a smoke detector won't help at that point. So David, I think, has pondered this, this amazing thing that every one of us... Um, hopefully have pondered in our lives. It doesn't matter if you're smart or not so smart or strong or weak. It doesn't matter. Every single one of us, every person who comes to the cross, in order to have a real encounter with God, you have to come to the end of you. I think that that's a problem for a lot of people. They profess faith in Christ. They profess believing, but they haven't really come to the end of themselves. And their relationship with God is tainted. It suffers because of that. And they wonder, why am I not growing? Why am I not maturing, you know? Um, To come to the place where I understand, you know what? I was just a little shepherd boy. You know? But I can remember sitting out there on those hills at night, looking at the stars, talking to my creator. And and look, he raised me up on high and he anointed uh, me to be the king of Israel. That's just absolutely amazing. Verse 2 says, the spirit of the Lord spoke by me. Now we know that there were many times that God's spirit spoke through David. He says, his word was on my tongue. There was a lot of times when there was words on David's tongue that weren't from the Spirit of God also. So we see this, um, we see this transparency in David's life. We see these uh, contradictions, if you will, on how David lived. And I can turn around and look at me and I can say, you know what, I'm kind of a contradiction too sometimes. Right? I don't always have the right words on my tongue. I want to have the words of the Lord on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. Now, let me ask you a question. Could this be Jesus? 
Who's the rock? Jesus is the rock of Israel. And he spoke to me. So was Jesus around before he was a little baby in Bethlehem? Absolutely. He was from everlasting to everlasting. Was he exactly the same as when he came to the earth in the human form? No. Absolutely not. He stepped out of glory into humanity. He, if you want to use the term, he devolved into a human. Right? It wasn't a promotion for him. He had spent all eternity as the creator of all things. The rock of Israel. And he told David, He who rules over men must be just. Ruling in the fear of God. Now that's a very powerful principle because if you don't have that, if you're a ruler and you don't live by those two simple principles, then you become, um, <laughs> you become an ungodly, what's the word I'm looking for? You become a, a person... I can't think of the word I'm looking for here. Um, you become what we see happening in our world today. Our, our leaders aren't governed by God. Right? And, and you see the result of it. You see the chaos of it. You see the disorder of what's going on around us. Because the men that rule over us, they're not just. The men who rule over us don't rule in the fear of God. But if they did, it would be a totally different world in which we live. But David knew. He knew that a person who rules in the fear of God will be like the light of the morning when the sun rises. A morning without clouds. Nice, clear, beautiful, blue sky when you wake up in the morning. Boy, we sure enjoy that around here. And, you know, we can relate to this right now. Like the tender grass springing out of the earth. I hear a lawnmower in the background here. It's springing, all right. It's growing so fast, you've got to strap a lawnmower on your rear end wherever you go to keep your yard in control these days. It's, it's nuts. <laughs> Crisp, clean air, blue sky after a rain and the... The beauty of spring in which we're, we're living in right now. And then verse 5 is a very telling, very telling verse. Although my house is not so with God, he has made with me an everlasting covenant. David recognizes that he didn't live up to, his, to God's standards. He didn't live up to his own standards. He made a lot of mistakes in his life, a lot of really bad choices in his life. And his house, as we saw, was in terrible disarray, wasn't it? And maybe sometimes we could look at that and say, you know what, my, my life hasn't been like that either. My, my life doesn't have tender grass springing up all the time. It's kind of, you know... Uh, my house is not in order like I would like it to be. I think we could go around the room and everybody would say that. I would like to have my house in better order before God as to what he sees. But here's the thing. He made an everlasting covenant with David. He's made an everlasting covenant with you. And David's coming to realize that even though his house wasn't totally in order, God's purposes for him had been fulfilled. Even though David wasn't the perfect expression of a 24-7 uh, great godly man, God worked through David to accomplish what he wanted to have accomplished. David's imperfection did not get in the way of God's plan. And we know that God's plan for David wasn't just for David. 
God's plan for David wasn't just for the children of Israel or Judah. The 12 tribes, yes, it was for them. And yes, it was for him. And yes, it was for his family. But he didn't always, he didn't always walk in that beauty that God had laid out for him. And it even goes further than that. It goes generations and generations and generations down the line where God's plan for David was that the Messiah would come through his bloodline. With all of his faults, with all of his failure, God didn't revoke that. God made a covenant with him. And it wasn't a temporary covenant. It wasn't a covenant that was based upon if I can hang on long enough, if I can be good long enough, I'll be able to have this covenant. No, this is an everlasting covenant that it's ordered in all things and secure. I love that. For this is all my salvation and all my desire. And will he not make it increase? Yes, he will make it increase. His sovereignty, his will, his power, his, his means of fulfilling his will in men and women is ordered. It's secure. Now, people have asked me over the years, do you believe in eternal security? I do. If you're born again and Jesus is your personal Savior, you can be secure. Right? But if you have any doubt about that, if you wonder, maybe I'm not born again, maybe I never really did commit my life to the Lord, I feel insecure. I don't know of any believers that are in Christ who feel insecure about their salvation. People who are insecure about their salvation are always the ones that look at the negative things. They're the ones that when they're reading the Bible, it's those hard scriptures that pop out to them, that haunt them. Drunkards, druggies, adulterers will not inherit the king. <gasps> I was one of those. I'm going to hell. You were one of those. But now you're a new creature in Christ. You have no reason to be insecure because your salvation isn't hinged upon you. Your salvation is fully, completely, absolutely secure in Him and what He has done. You think David's in the presence of the Lord today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if I was the judge, would I sit down with David and look over his records and say, well, let's see, your good outweighed your bad, so I'll let you in. Or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe he did so many bad things that they outweighed the good things he did. And then I would have to say, well, Dave, sorry. Get your fire suit on. Eternity is a long time. You know, that's not how it works with God. Mortals people like us, we judge things totally, totally different through our eyes than how God judges things through his eyes. He sees us, he sees us as perfect today. Wow, how can that be true? You mean he doesn't see it when I'm thinking bad thoughts? Yeah, he does, but it's covered up. It's covered by the blood of Jesus. It's the righteousness of Christ that makes me acceptable in His sight tonight. And I am therefore, because I'm acceptable in His sight, that means His goodness is on me. And His goodness makes me secure in my salvation. Well, what about works? What about good works? You know, James said, you know, faith without works is dead. Well, James was right. James is trying to give us some insight to a whole different side of grace. If you're who you say you are, shouldn't your life reflect that? Absolutely. I like to use this phrase. 
God takes away the have-tos in our life and he replaces it with want-tos. Not one of you have to be here tonight. You don't have to. You don't have to be here Sunday. You don't have to read your Bible. You don't have to do anything. And what a bummer it is to live life thinking that you have a relationship with God when everything is about, I have to do this. I have to do that. And oh boy, I can't do that. Or I can't do, oh boy, I don't want to do that either. That's the old man. That's the old way. That's the way of the flesh. But we're new creatures in Christ. We get blessed by serving the Lord. We get blessed by being His children. We want to be together. We want to be with Him. We want to serve Him. Now, I know sometimes serving the Lord can be a little bit weary. You can get tired. You can get where you need rest and things like that. But the want to never goes away. If I ever wake up in the morning and say, Doc, God, and I have to go to church today. I'm going to retire. I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to cry for God's mercy. Because I want my relationship with God to be secure because of what Jesus has done for me. Because He is sovereign. And will He not make it increase? Won't He bless it? Won't we grow and mature? And Jesus said, bear fruit. Bear much fruit. As a matter of fact, He said, this is how your Father is glorified, when you bear much fruit. That's the goal. Now, we're seeing the blossoms on the trees. Have you heard any trees grunting to pop a blossom around here lately? No. Are we going to hear trees grunting and straining to grow an apple? No. It happens naturally, doesn't it? It comes naturally. It's in the good soil. It has enough water. It has enough sunlight. And it will naturally bear fruit. Sometimes we walk around as Christians and we're grunting and groaning and, man, I got to grow some mercy. Mm." Right? It comes natural. It follows my relationship with the Lord. It follows the fact that I'm planted in a good place. My roots are deep. I'm being fed. I'm in a good place. I'm receiving the sunshine that I need to make me grow. But then he looks at the other side of the coin in verse 6. The sons of rebellion shall all be as thorns thrust away it's kind of how people are sometimes you ever have a thorny person in your life Hmm? somebody that just you just get around them and you start getting prickled from them lord do something about this will you well it says here they're going to be thrust away they can't be taken out by hands they you can't do it i can't do it the man who touches them must be armed He must have the right tools in order to cut down those thorn bushes. I don't think I ever saw so many thorn bushes until I moved to Oregon. These briars that grow, you know, all over everything. And every summer I go out there and I do battle with them. And I come out all cut up and scratched up, you know. Come to church and like, what happened, a cat attack you or what? No, it was my bushes, you know. Got to have the right tools, huh? But you know, God has those tools. They will be utterly burned with fire in their place. A little bit of reflection, a little bit of honesty here. And as he goes on now, we're going to enter into a totally different um, page here as to what he's talking about. We're going to reflect back now on history. And the mighty men of David. So he's going to talk about some of these men. Let's read through it. These are the names of the mighty men who David had. Joshua Basaheth to Beth, who was a Tachmonite. Oh, brother, this is going to be nuts trying to get through these words. 
This guy was uh, the chief among the captains. He's the one that sat in, a, a, in the seat of, of being the ruler over the, uh, the, the warriors. And uh, he was called Adino the Isnite. Now, check this out. Because he killed 800 men at one time. Now, that's one bad dude. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. How would you like to have the name Dodo? Hey, Dodo, what's up? I don't know. I'm just a Dodo. Dodo was an Ahohite. He was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. So it was David and three other guys. It's interesting because he gives these men certain honor. There's, there's three of them specifically that he gives the most honor to and then a lot of honor to the ones that were kind of underneath a little bit. But this fellow here, he's kind of at the top of the list. It says that he rose and he attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to plunder. Wow. So they're standing back watching this battle go on. This guy's taking out 800. He gets so tired. I, I almost envision this as his hand cramping up and gripping the sword and because he, he's so weary and he can't get his hand, you know, but he keeps fighting. And meanwhile, all the armies that ran away are standing there going, oh, yeah, good, get that guy. Oh, dude, oh, yeah, oh, get that. And now it's time to go and plunder them. And we're going to get all their weapons and their riches and... Isn't that kind of how people are sometimes, though? You know, God gives you people in your life that are like this dude. They will stand with you no matter what. When everybody else runs, they stay. When things get ugly, they stay. And then there's always those who come in afterwards, and they just want to kind of reap the harvest and enjoy the benefits. And after him was a man named Shammah. He was the son of Agi. The Hararite. The Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. And so the people fled from the Philistines. But he stationed himself in the middle of the field and defended it and killed the Philistines. And so the Lord brought about a great victory. So here's a guy who was right in the middle of it. He wasn't running. He wasn't hiding behind anything. He was in the middle of the field and he defended it and he killed the enemy. Now remember, as we're looking at these battles that took place, we have battles that we go through also in our lives. The Philistines were always like the picture of Satan, the devil, the evil one. Always coming after God's people. And we have Philistines in our lives that we do battle with. But the question is, you know, I read these things and I always have to ask myself, well, where are you at, Tom? Are you in the middle of the field or are you hiding up on the hill waiting for the battle to be over? And then there were three of the 30 chief men who went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Abdullam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And so three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, and they drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate. And they took it and they brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but he poured it out to the Lord. Far be it from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. 
These things were done by three mighty men. You remember that story that we read back chapters and chapters ago, right? When David was hiding in the cave. Now, a lot of these mighty men, they weren't always mighty men. A lot of these mighty men were the ones that were discontented. They were unhappy. They were in debt. They were, <clears throat> they were being pressed by the government. They weren't happy in their existence. And so when David fled from Saul, all the people who were in debt, discontented, unhappy, they joined David at this cave. And these people, these guys, they're the ones that became these mighty men that we're reading about here. Verse 18, Abashai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of another three. He lifted his spear against 300 men and killed them, and he won a name among these three. He was not the most honored of three, or was he not, sorry, the most honored of three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. So we've seen the first three already. Now he's going down another level to another group of three. Benaiah was the son of Jehoiada the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab, and he also had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. And he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, and so he went down to him with a staff, and he wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things Benaniah, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, did. And he won a name among three mighty men. He was more honored than the thirty, but he did not attain to the first three. But David appointed him over his guard. Interesting, isn't it? These people that he was doing battle with, what a description. He killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. It, may, it makes my imagination just go, like, lion-like? What did they look like? How come they were lion-like? Did they roar? Did they have big beards? What was it? Were they dressed in fur um, that made them look like a lion? Um, I don't know. It just opens up our imagination, though, that this little fact, this little tidbit of information, would distinguish these two men from all the other ones that died. Not only did he kill the lion-like men, he killed a real lion. And he killed him in a pit. Now, I don't know if he fell in the pit and the lion came in after him, or if the lion was in a pit and he killed the lion in the pit. Either way, it was a snowy day. How about that? That's pretty cool. I remember it was a snowy day. And then this Egyptian, I love the way it describes him. He was a spectacular man. That's really cool. Guys, how would you like somebody to say that about you? Man, that Ray, he is a spectacular man, right? I love it. This Egyptian had a spear in his hand. And so this fella um, takes the spear away from him with his staff. You have to be very skilled with a staff in order to get the spear out of this man's hands. And kills him with his own spear. This Benaiah... The son of Jehoiada, he did these things, and he won a name among these men. And then there's Ashahel, the brother of Joab. He was one of the thirty. Elanan, the son of Dodo, 
of Bethlehem, Dodo got around, didn't he? Shema'a, the Herodite, Elika, the Herodite, Helez, the Peltite, Ira, the son of Ikesh, the Tekoite, Abizer, the Anathoite, Mibunai, <laughs> <laughs> um, the Hushathite. Man, there's a lot of fights. The mosquito bites and the, you know, they just keep on going. Zalman, the Ahoite, Mahaari, the Neto Flight. <laughs> you got me, guys. And then there's Hell of the son of Baana. And he was that. And then there was Atai, the son of Rabbi. Atai and Rabbi from Gibeah, the children of Benjamin. Then Benaiah, a Pira the night, and Hidai from the brooks of Gaash, Al Alban, Ali Aban, the Arathabite, Arathite, <laughs> Azumeth, the Berhumite. Where did all these people come from? I thought they were Israelites. Right? There's a lot of ites. Are they, I mean, it makes me wonder, are these just tiny little family groups? Are they like little clusters of tribes or little clusters of villages? And they have these different names from their, uh, I don't know, I don't know. From their ancestors, perhaps. If you're ever really, really bored, and you want to do some really important Bible study, you can find out who these guys are and you can come and let me know about it. <laughs> then there, uh, where are we here? Uh, oh, there's Eliphalet, uh, the son of Abashbi, the son of Maakathite, Eli Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, now there's a name we recognize, the Gilanite, Hezreel, the Carmelite, I like that, Carmelite. Um, Perari, the Arbite. Egel, the son of Nathan, of Zobah. Bani, the Gadite. Zelek, the Ammonite. Nahari, the Beth, the right. And he was the armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zariah. And then there was Ira, the Ithrite. And Garab, the Ithrite, and Uriah, the Hittite, 37 in all. <clears throat> I got a tongue cramp. So, you know, back in the day here, um, your name meant something. Now, I don't know what Tom means. I don't even know if it has a meaning. But we know that, like, um, Isaac. What did the word Isaac mean? Laughter. Every, and many times they would name their children, perhaps according to current events that were going on, uh, things that were happening in their families, and their villages. If there was a famine, maybe not so happy of a name. Uh, so it would be very curious to go through here and to do a little study on that and just make a list. You can put it right on the chalkboard over there. And uh, next Wednesday, you can share that with us, okay? No? Everyone's saying, no, I don't want to do that. So here we have a record of these 37 men who stood with David now, you, you know that thousands and thousands and thousands of people died in these battles. The numbers that we read in here are staggering. When they go out to battle and it says that they killed 150,000 Philistines, that 30,000 of David's men died in the battle. Wow. That's just amazing to me that so many people... and. Who were these guys? 
They were just Israelites. They were just soldiers. They were just all these ites. They were part of all these ites right here that came together for a common good, for a common cause to serve King David. I think all of these people, no matter what their background was, um, they recognized what David had said earlier in our text, that God anointed him, that the power of the creator of the universe rested upon David. And if you're going to serve anybody, you want to serve someone who's got the power of God resting upon their lives, right? You know, when they first got into the land, Joshua was leading them, and they were going to go to Jericho. And when they sent the spies out, um, and they had that encounter with the prostitute there that lived there, Rahab, one of the things she told them was, we've heard about you guys. We've heard about what happened in Egypt. We've heard that your God is God. Everyone in the region heard about the God of Jacob. They heard the story of the sea opening up so that they could cross over. They heard the story of the great victories that they had won. And the people in Jericho, for instance, were terrified. They were terrified at the name of Jehovah. They were terrified at the name of the God of Israel. Now, how many of you know that Israel and Jacob are one and the same? Did you know that? One and the same. So when Jacob was born... <clears throat> Just a, a thought. When Jacob was born, he was born in humble circumstances, much like David. But Jacob had a reputation of kind of being a backstabber. A used car salesman, if you will. He was the heel catcher. He was the one that was nipping at the heel all the time. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't the outstanding person like you would think he was very selfish self-centered he was a tattletale his daddy made him a special jacket and his brothers hated him because he had this special jacket I'm sorry I got my story confused I just had a check in my brain anyway so Jacob his name was changed. Why was his name changed? Because he had a confrontation with God. He tried to wrestle with the angel of the Lord. Yeah. All night long. It's an amazing story, you know, and you can almost see this angel just flicking him around. Oh, we're coming back for more. Okay, flick. you know, it's not a wrestling match. There's no contest, right? But he played with him all night long. And his name was, he became, he went from tattletale to broken man all in one night. And his name was changed to Israel. So Jacob the heel catcher, Jacob the con man, his name was changed to Israel, governed by God. Or the prince of God, either one. I like the name governed by God. So when you're reading scripture, many, many times when you refer to the name, the reason I'm telling you this is when you refer to the name of Jacob, it's not much of a positive note. Because Jacob was the tattletale. He was the man in the flesh. He was the schemer. But when you hear the nation referred to as the nation of Israel, then that's in a whole different light. That's in a light that that nation is being governed by God. So, are we Jacob or are we Israel? David, he kind of pondered in both ends of that, didn't he? Sometimes he was Jacob, 
Sometimes he was Israel. But the beautiful thing about it is every one of these men God brought to him to get him to where he was at this very moment when he, when he was recording this. To get him through. And God brings people to us to get us through. It's his work that does that. It's an amazing thing to sit back and to reflect on your own life and to see the path that you've gone down. Sometimes there was some, you know, U-turns and, you know, kind of going around the block a few times, you know. Sometimes victory going on the straight path and sometimes not so straight. But God's purposes are going to be fulfilled in your life, nevertheless. In all of our lives, amen? So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you tonight, Lord. What a wonderful record we have here of these mighty men who were with David. And, and we know, Lord, that many of them started out just as farmers or they weren't necessarily warriors, but Lord, you, you fashioned them. Uh, you equipped them. And you equipped David. And you built a great army from these misfits. And, uh, and Lord, that gives us much confidence tonight because some of us are kind of misfits too. But yet you, you called us. You have purpose for us. You have a reason for us being here. And we're thankful for that. And Lord, I, I want to speak for all of us, I hope, tonight, that, that we want to yield to that, Lord. We want to be Israel. We don't want to be playing games. We don't want to be in the shadows. We don't want to be running and, and just trying to partake of the, 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 the spoil. We want to be in the fight, Lord. We want to be on the field, not in the grandstands or not on the sideline. So help us, God. Give us courage in whatever areas that, that our little worlds uh, involve, Lord, in our lives, wherever we could be used. Thank you that you've called us by name. Thank you that you remember our name. And continue, Lord, that work that you started in us. We know that you will until the time of Christ. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.